Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. I got my green going on here. We got the green going on in the lights. And this is the first episode I'm producing of the weekly wrap-up review, where I go over the movies I've seen this past week and just review them. Um, I might include TV shows here from time to time and so on and so forth, but we're going to be focusing all on movies that I've seen, things I might have done short reviews of, things I haven't done short reviews of. Go more in-depth, and I'm changing up my game this year, I am doing something new, and I'm introducing a ranking system to my movie reviews. Now, I'm somebody who was always troubled with some, you know, creators out there that I think have really great ranking systems. Probably my favorite um, on YouTube is Double Toasted. They do a ranking system where they do, you know, better than sex for their favorite, favorite, favorite content. Um, full price for a movie they think is worth a full price admission. Uh, matinee if they think if it's still a recommendation but maybe wait to where you can save some money and so on and so forth and another one i like is dan merle with his chart of you know see it now love it like it neutral like avoid he, he has a wide range and i think it matches things well but i didn't want to copy somebody else's per se so what i did was i made my own and as being somebody who's been a gamer now for way too many years and playing many different games with ranked versions, I finally had the brilliant idea of bringing my ratings and ranked and video games together. Now here we see my five personal rating scales. At the very top, you have Diamond, which I think is the best of the best that I've seen in any, any given year. Platinum, I would say, are very good movies that I'd recommend anybody go and see. Gold are good movies that I enjoy, but I might give light recommendations based on certain qualities or what I, who I think would like certain movies. Silver are going to be movies that I think do perfectly fine. I think they're okay, but I think they're probably better seen when they're on a streaming service where you're not having to pay a little bit extra for them. And then bronze movies are movies that you can watch at your own risk. You may watch these movies and enjoy them, but they're not things that I enjoyed, and they were things that would actively tell people not to watch. Now... Without further ado, let's talk about the four movies that I got to see this weekend, starting with Love Lies Bleeding. Hey. So where did you appear from? Oklahoma. I've never been anywhere but here. We'll just need to fight back. I'm gonna tell them everything you ever did. FBI, open up. Are you threatening me? I'll never fall in love, okay? Love Lies Bleeding was this R-rated thriller romance movie that I wasn't sure what to expect, except I heard some very good things word of mouth. The main actresses in here are going to be Kristen Stewart, we all know from Twilight, but now known for other things, including being an Academy Award-nominated actress. Katie O'Brien as Jackie. And then some other popular names like Dave Franco and Ed Harris. Now, this movie takes place, I would say, in your peak 80s format. You have Kristen Stewart playing Lou, a butchy female is what they would try to portray her as, who works at a gym and is not interested in the male and does have a beginning love interest potentially with a character named Daisy played pretty well by Anna Barry Shinovkoff. I apologize, Anna, if you're watching this for whatever reason you, and I messed up your name, but then that's when she meets Katie O'Brien's Jackie and Jackie is this quintessential eighties bodybuilder who is just hits all the eighties marks she is on her way to Las Vegas to compete in a bodybuilding competition, and she has to spend some time to get some money in this town where Lou and so many others live and Lou's family. Also being very involved is Dave Franco, who plays the husband of Lou's sister, who also happens to give Jackie a job at a gun range that is owned by Lou Sr. So you can already tell family dynamics here are all messed around. Add in there a couple big series plot points, and you actually get yourself a pretty thriller of a movie. When I think of the standouts here, Kristen Stewart and Katie O'Brien, first year standout acting individuals, I think their relationship 
at first kind of feels forced, but you go through those motions in the beginning of part of the movie so that when you get near the middle part in the end of the movie, I think much of the, of the payoff with the relationship works out as the movie gets more thrilling. You see Lou introduce Jackie to steroids. And that this is one thing where I don't want to spoil too much about it, but I was really impressed and happy to see the conversations about what steroids may be like. And I was, you know, I applaud this director for going out of the way, you know, director Rose Glass to maybe give a movie anti-steroids in their own way and seeing how that can affect somebody's not just physical body, but also their mind mixed in. There is a menacing performance from Ed Harris. As we learn more and more about Lou senior, we understand more why Lou is the way she is and why everything in this town kind of feels off as a whole. And I think Ed Harris, just like you see him in things like Westworld gives that great villainy type performance and is very stoic and very charismatic in his own Ed Harris ways. Dave Franco, again, playing the brother-in-law of Lou. Um, he's married to her, you know, her sister Beth. And this is, this is also pretty interesting. Now I don't say interesting subplot, but there's a pretty emotional subplot that happens there. And Dave Franco plays your average asshole that you hate seeing on screen. Um, mix in there with a little bit of a mystery of what might have happened to Lou's mom. What exactly is going on that Lou is so afraid of and understanding what the steroids are doing to Jackie. And I think as this movie goes on and we see more and more going on, you get some very thrilling sequences. You get some very high intensity moments and you really get to breathe into a lot of these characters more than I was imagining at the start of this movie. Now I am just going to say off the bat that this was one of the best movies I've seen in March so far. And when I think about what it made this movie so great, it's just the chemistry between Stuart and O'Brien, Jackie and, and Lou, and the thrilling story it takes in the second act overall and much of the third act. I don't know what's going to be coming. I don't know exactly who are going to be the good guys or the bad guys or if there's any type of guys in this movie, and I don't know who may live and who may die. And... Everything was leading to this to being a diamond rating for me, but it did something at the end that I think was very artistic and definitely a bold choice, but not one that hit with me. Now, I admire artists and directors and, and screenwriters doing ambitious things like this. Sometimes they pay off very well, and sometimes, like this movie, it kind of detracts and it takes you out of what is a very pinnacle climax moment. But overall... Love Lies Bleeding gets a platinum movie review from me. I think this movie is very good. It's one that if you like thrillers, I really recommend you see. Obviously, there's going to be some nudity in this. There's going to be some lesbian sex scenes. If that offends you, maybe don't go and see it. But if that you're okay with that and you want something interesting and kind of different than what you see in the movie theaters nowadays, Love Lies Bleeding is exactly what that's going to be for you. We all know anything can happen out there. Sometimes we feel lost. We push and we suffer. We keep going. That makes all the difference. Let's talk again to meatballs. Three days, 200 miles ago. Leave the stupid dog and let's go. Come on. Move, dumb talk. What is it, boy? Oh. Oh, God. Can't believe I almost walked right off that cliff. Extra meatballs for you, my friend. What's he doing? She's been through so much. This dog needs a vet. I don't want you to hurt anymore. No. He's a fighter. Just like you. Guess what? I'm not a dog person. <laughs> Arthur the King is what you expect out of not just a underdog sports story, but your classic dog story. Um, this movie that is starring both Mark Wahlberg as the lead role of Michael and Simu Liu as the lead role of Liam takes you through what I think is a pretty heartwarming and endearing story that does have very big Hollywood caveats and cliches. And if that stuff bothers you, might not recommend you to go check this one out this weekend, but definitely holds its own in different ways. When I think about Arthur the King, 
my favorite thing about this movie is Simu Liu. He is definitely more of the supporting character, and sometimes he acts more as the bratty villain of the team that uh, Michael, you know, builds with you know Mark Wahlberg's characters builds. But not only do I think his character journey is there throughout, but his character always makes sense to me as an individual. And when you have these sports stories, when you have some of these real life based on true stories, I want characters, whether they're villains, whether they're adversaries, whether they're teammates, to find feel real and grounded. And everything about Simu Liu's performance felt real and grounded for the most part. And the more I see him in these side roles, where whether it's in this movie here, whether it's being a background Ken in, in Barbie, Simu Liu is a very good actor. And I think we saw with Shang Chi that he has the capability of being a leading man in movies like this, or just movies in general. We know he can do comedy. We saw him in Kim Convenience do amazing work overall. And once again here, I'm watching this performance, and I'm like, I wish he just had a lead actor, and he was in a movie that I could just watch from beginning to end. And they would just give him a chance. I know he's not your big name at the moment. I know he's in some ways... He might not be that draw to an average individual, but I think Simo Liu is just a very good charismatic actor that is very relatable when you watch on the big screen. Mark Wahlberg as Michael was pretty decent overall too. He gives you all the Mike, you know, Mark Wahlberg isms when you see one of his movies. His snarty sarcasm, his "Oh, you got to believe in me. I'm going to show you." Kind of the stuff you see in a lot of his movies. But again, I didn't mind it overall and. It was just your typical type performance when it comes to Mark Wahlberg and it comes to a main character in that sport underdog movie. Now, I do have to say the acting drops off pretty significantly from here. Um, Julie Rylance, who plays Helena, and Natalie Emanuel, who plays... Um, I forget who exactly she plays in this movie. She plays the climbing character. They give pretty bland line leading like line readings overall in the script is the thing that i feel is the biggest hindrance of this movie um arthur the, the king is a story that took place actually in ecuador not dominican republic like we see in this movie um that happened in like 2016 2017 somewhere around there and it feels like the type of like hollywood script rushing to the screen because it's this incredible story and not enough of let's write a good movie that fits all the characters in the story. So everybody, when they're talking and giving lines, it doesn't feel like we're just speed running to get to the emotional high point moments. I do think parts of the movie with the dog and kind of showing the dog story can work decently well. You definitely get invested in this dog's life and who Arthur is as an individual, as, as, as a, you know, as a creature per se, as a, a an innocent soul. And the connection that he makes with the team is heartwarming at, you know, at the highest points of this movie. Now, when I give this movie a rating overall, I really can't go beyond gold. I enjoyed it. I think it's a good movie. I would give it light recommendations for people who, if you want to watch a movie that's going to be your classic sports movie, it has your heart strings being ripped out, you know, being like, you know, pulled on because you're adding an animal in there too. If that's the type of movie you're going to enjoy, this is a movie to check out either in theaters or, or rent it and own it whenever it hits digital. It got an A cinema score, A minus cinema score. So it has pretty good word of mouth from individuals. And I think it's a very easy crowd pleaser. But for me, those bad line readings on things, I just can't go up and put it above a gold rating. But Arthur the King out in theaters right now. Let's move on to our next movie. How was a field trip, boys? No, we gotta hand feed the giraffe. Yeah, the sucker was eating right out of her palm. You made this? How old are you guys? 16. 14. You idiots are gonna end up on the side of a frickin' milk carton. We need to back some summer jobs. You think you can hook us up? You can ask if they need an extra hand. What's what? That thing. Snack Shack. I think they bid it out at the city council meeting. I wanna pitch you an idea. Okay. You bid $2,000 on the Snack Shack at the swimming pool. Actually, we bid three. <gasps> Total shithole. This is fucking epic, dude. I just wanna have fun this summer. Feel me? One little advice, homie. Make a move. Any move.
Give me a fucked up, kid. Cool. You're unbelievable. This movie was the one that was not on any radar of mine until I looked at the theaters and what was being played this weekend here for me locally. Snack Shack. This kind of coming of age, early 1990s teen story where it kind of hits all your genre type things. It's rated R, so you get the teenagers saying the F word. They, in a lot of ways, feel like teenagers throughout. The relationship between Connor Sherry's AJ and Gabriel LaBelle's Moose is one that is just feels very natural. It feels like best friend type relationships, though. I do think at points they do kind of write Moose to be kind of an a-hole, just a little, little bit too much. Um, Nick Robertson kind of comes in as more of that older teenage mentor to these two. And you have the battled love interest that is like a three-way love interest with both Moose and AJ with Mika Bedelia, who plays Brooke. And this was just a very enjoyable movie. I was not aware that this was going to be as fun as it was. You definitely get the sense that this movie, the acting from both kids here, I don't want to call them kids, both young adults here from Sherry and the Bell, just did such a good job acting in the, like as if they were 14 years old, 15 years old. I love their chemistry throughout. I love the way they talk. The idea of them being kind of teenagers that are trying to make easy, quick profits, doing things like trying to make their own beer and selling it, trying to you know illegally bet at dog racing to you know getting themselves into the scenario where they bid and win for a snack shack at the local pool pulling three thousand dollars out most of their own savings and ending up turning that into a summer adventure of a lifetime i think you have a lot of progression in aj's character really really done well by sherry here and you see him kind of learn from his previous mistakes he starts off the movie being like that annoying douchebaggy kid and as the movie goes on he doesn't lose that douchebaggy kid energy for fully he still very much feels like a 15 year old as the movie ends but you do see him kind of mature and understand parts of life and the relationship that he has around his whole family you really see that go i love you know the way the mom and the dad his mom and dad were portrayed um AJ's mom and dad and portrayed and AJ is very much more of the center character of the whole movie. So a lot of it is on Sherry's shoulders to be able to show all these different range of emotions and being able to be comedic, to be able to be kind of dramatic, to understand who he is as a kid and not feel like you're just watching an adult act as a kid and not being written correctly. Snack Shack was just a great time. And there are parts that can be happy. There's parts that can be frustrating. And for me, the biggest frustrating parts, again, were a little bit overdramatic writing for both Moots and AJ. But at the end of the day, those are minor, minor critiques and what I was have thought was a really good movie overall. And it's one that I would say take a chance on. If you like these kind of coming of age 90s, you know, movies based in the 90s and the 80s that, you know, you have kids acting like kids, just doing summer stuff. Working a snack shack to try and make their money back and more and seeing the relationships build with everybody in the town throughout. It's one that I recommend. I do think it drags a bit, and that's what puts it in my gold ranking. It's near the top of my gold ranking for the year. Um, I do re recommend it for people. Like, Be aware, there's a lot of F words. There's a lot of swear words. There's a lot of kids maybe not acting as kidly as a lot of people may want their kids to see. But overall, this was a very grounded into reality type movie and one that I really enjoyed. And I think it ended at like a perfect spot where you're having AJ and his dad just sitting on the porch and just the way that interaction goes, just really show the full progression of AJ as a character and where he's been through this whole movie, as well as how his parents view him uh, from beginning of the movie to the end of the movie. And it really just ends it off in a very, very just enjoyable way. Snack Shack. It's in theaters if you get a chance to see it. Otherwise, I recommend finding some place to watch this whenever it's on streaming. I don't know where it will come out at, but I really enjoyed Snack Shack. 
and I can't recommend it enough for people to go and see. I, I think you'd have a good time. If you like movies like Super Bad and that type of alley type of stuff, not as good as Super Bad, but in that same vein. But without further ado, all the good reviews and the nice things they had to say are ending. It's time to talk about the American Society of Magical Negroes. See you after this clip. Watching you walk through a room full of white people was the most painful thing I've ever seen. Excuse me. Sorry. I don't want to take you to a job interview. There's a recruiting class starting right now, and we got to get you in it. Welcome to the American Society of Magical Negroes. I don't really understand. It's easier to say. What's the most dangerous animal on the planet? The shark. White people, when they feel uncomfortable. Someone defied the society. Who was it? You didn't let her go like I told you. If you interfere with her or your client, you could have your memory erased. You won't even remember she existed. Even though we might never see each other again, I need you to know that what we had was real. I'm curious to see how you're going to make it out of all this. Well, one of the movies I've been enjoying the previews for for so long here is the American Society of Magical Negroes. Why? Because like American fiction, I thought it was going to tell a very socially adept and witty script and story, giving a lot of social commentary and kind of coming up with, I think, a very fun, easy resolution to it. I'm Justice Smith, who last year on this time I was really enjoying in, in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Honor Among Thieves is leading in this movie, and I can't complain much with his acting and much of the acting of the cast. David Allen Gnar or An Lee Bogan all did a pretty phenomenal job with the bad material they were given. But unlike American Fiction, which was able to give such a strong and amazing supporting script throughout to tell a social commentary story on top of a myriad of other type of you know commentary and stories going on throughout that movie american society of magical negroes fails at that miserably when it's okay to use very big social cliches and you know use in thing you know you know public racial divides as commentary and background for the movies. And I honestly like seeing that because I love to see things from other people's perspectives. And this movie just went a little bit over the top on that perhaps, and didn't was very sloppily with how it presented it and how it made it go through. Now I understand I am a white individual, so I should not be commenting this badly or this harshly about a movie. That's very much the soul of it is, Black people need to make white people feel comfortable. So, with, with just no, so put that there, and just know though that that main idea was one that I was excited to see and, and understand better, and, and really go in more. And I felt as if this movie made that premise into a joke caricature that you're supposed to kind of laugh at and kind of roll your eyes at. And it wasn't really giving it many, you know, it was really, you can tell it was trying to make that its, its purpose, but it wasn't doing it in a way where I felt it being real, except for the kind of climax of this movie at a presentation with Justin, J Justin Smith's character, Aaron, where he really gives off his emotions. And that part of the movie was the best part of the movie. The unfortunate part was, is that soul of the movie, that feeling, that moment was not earned fully because so much of this other parts of the movie was just really bad joke telling was really weird dynamics. And I think it's an important subject when it comes to, especially in movies and TV shows, how black characters are very much there to support usually leading white characters. Very rarely do we see in movies when you look at lead actors and actresses have leads that aren't white. And I'm, it's something that is changing, you know, and I'm not saying that it's not, it's not impossible. Obviously, people like Denzel Washington, Viola Davis, um, you know, we saw Michelle Yeoh with a couple movies previously, um, you know, hopefully people like Lily Gladstone and so many others, you know, Lupita Nyong'o um, and Us. There's a variety of, of, of actors and actresses that can, of many different colors and backgrounds that are now starting to slowly 
integrate themselves in leading movies, but it, it's very honestly, when you look at things like the movies that are nominated for Best Pictures, when you just look at what movies are out in general, it's very much the, the truth that you usually have a white star with a some type of minority supporting character. And I was really hoping that this movie would kind of delve into that idea. And the idea of these magic, you know, the magical Negro society trying to appease white people and turn them, you know, make sure they don't get too upset and turn on the, you know, black people again. If you have a better scriptwriter, if you do it better, you know, more subtly, if you use some really grounded and good moments throughout, I think you can really tell a decent story here and hit this message home and make it into a very relatable way. But this potential mixed with a love story, mixed with just colony elements per se, and what the individuals are doing to make their white clients happy, just didn't hit that tone and didn't have that subtleness. And even if it wasn't trying to be subtle, it wasn't like over the top in a non, like in a way that I could respect. It was trying to take this very touchy, realistic subject and turning a lot of those aspects into kind of jokes per se, with the intention that people would not view them as jokes. You know, this very real grounded issue, you know, in, in everyday life that I think we're getting over, but it feels like every time we take five steps, we take two or three steps back at the same time. And I just really wanted this movie to be a lot better. Again, I'm not going to blame the acting. I think Justice Smith in this movie was as good as you can get given the material. The blanket references to things like Facebook and Elon Musk were there in different areas. The his client, who is you know played by Rupert Friend, there was a moment where I was during Justice Smith's kind of peak. Uh, emotional moment where I was like, oh, are they going to be interesting and show that this individual is going to start understanding, you know, Justin, Justin's character, Justice's character, Aaron, and what his vulnerabilities are. And they just blow kind of by that. And maybe that is the part party that <laughs> wants to say that, hey, I do care and stuff. Like we do think about that stuff and we do care. We want to relate. Wishing I saw that in the movie. And it, like I said, it felt like they were going to go there, but they really didn't. And the movie kind of just ends. And part of the movie also, too, was kind of Justice Smith saying, you know, his character kind of saying that, you know, my job shouldn't be trying to make other people around me happy just so I can live. I should want to live just to live in general. And again, I don't think it, I think it missed the mark on that per se. And I was just really disappointed with this movie. It gets my bronze ranking, which, again, maybe you will see this movie at your own risk and you'll like it and you can tell me I'm wrong. But it was just not one that I can recommend to many people because it was just not a great time at the theater. It was one of those movies when it ended, there was no clapping. People kind of like got out of their seats a little lazily. It wasn't like they were darting for the door, but it wasn't like they were enthused to talk about what they saw. And again, after seeing American Fiction, this script premise really got me excited thinking we're going to get some more good social commentary movie and it just wasn't that and that's why i think it's kind of not even being advertised much it's why it's only in like a thousand theaters you can tell that this might have been wanting to be an oscar movie that just didn't have the script writing behind it because it's made by focus features but it is what it is sometimes these movies don't hit and that's the way it is but that's going to be it for this week's weekend wrap up movie reviews we can wrap up reviews tell me if you like this format down below tell me if you agree with my ratings on any of these movies if you saw them like and subscribe and i will see you back next sunday where we talk about ghostbusters check out the review for short reviews when it comes out later this week as well too but until then see you have a happy st patrick's day and if you see this outside of st patrick's day just enjoy it like it's st patrick's day it's a great day Peace.